Welcome back. In keeping with our theme of taking your grief and turning it to good, grief isn't always about death and dying. Grief can come from so many places. It can come from a difficult childhood. It can come from a difficult relationship. It can come from some bad choices or just things that drive you to make decisions that maybe you wouldn't normally make under easier circumstances. Our next guest is an author, an attorney, a TEDx speaker. She actually gave the TEDx talk using life's changes as a force for good. And we're so excited to have her with us. She's also a radio show host, a podcast host. This woman obviously does not let the moss grow under her feet. <laughs> So Maria Olson is a biracial attorney, journalist, author, TEDx speaker, mentor, radio show host, and podcast host of Becoming Your Best Version. And that's a topic that we always address here. So I really want to talk to Maria today about her latest book, which is her fourth book called 50 After 50. 50. So while it sounds like another hundred things to do before you die, and let's jump in, there you go. The, I want to read some of the testimonials that have been written about this book, because this is what really impressed me, is that Maria uses this book as a roadmap of the courage, growth, and honesty, and her spirit of adventure that is required by all of us to reinvent ourselves as life circumstances show up and demand change. So we know that this is happening for all of us, and it's just a question of how we then respond to it. The 50 after 50 would make you think you have to wait to 50, <laughs> but I would say, and this reader agrees, why limit oneself to only after you're 50? Maria encourages and inspires the reader to explore what's possible at any age and at any next stage in your life. And I'm all for that. We want to be the best wherever we are. And the last one is that there are so many books that tell you how you should live your life that here I really applaud Maria for not taking that direction. She's not here to coach you, but she is here to suggest vague formulas that worked for her. And frankly, I think we all learn best from each other. So with that, I would love to introduce you to Maria Olson. Maria, thank you so much for being here. And let's just start with, you know, a little bit of your background, because I know our viewers now are going to want to know what went on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that kind introduction. Yes, I am an attorney, civil litigator in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, and in 1962, my parents were forbidden by law to marry in Maryland because interracial marriage was illegal in 16 states, including Maryland, which is now a firmly blue state. I'm sorry, I'm babysitting a uh, mastiff dog who is scratching <laughs> at the door. That's fine. <laughs> I grew up in Kensington, Maryland, a sleepy suburb of Washington, DC, as the only brown person in a sea of white and always felt other than. I excelled in school. I came from a broken home after my parents divorced in 1969. It was cause for excommunication in the Catholic church. So while my parents were, quote, thrown out of the church, I was forced to go by my parents to Catholic school where I attended uh, for all the way through Jesuit college. I don't think there are any Catholic law schools. Oh yes, I'm sorry, there is one. But in any event, I became a lawyer. I had a lot of uh, professional success, but I felt very empty inside. I had have two beautiful children who are adults living their own lives in Chicago and Los Angeles. I'm really proud of them. But when they were pushing me away, as most teenagers do, to gain their independence, to cut the apron spring, strings, I started to feel as if I had put all of my eggs in the motherhood basket. And I didn't know who I was anymore. I gave up my willingly my legal career, I was at that time, the time I had children, I was a political appointee 
in the Clinton Justice Department. And I loved that job. But when I was pregnant with my first child, somehow the chair of the Judiciary Committee's demand at 11 p.m. was not as important to me. So I moved into the policy development office at the Justice Department and worked on developing a pro bono program government-wide for the US government. Oddly, there was not one before the early 90s. And uh, with a team of committed, committed attorneys at the Justice Department, we formulated the very first pro bono program at the United States Justice Department, which still exists today. Wow, that's super. That's It's very heartening to be a part of something like that, isn't it? It is indeed. And thir three years later, I became pregnant with my second child. And at that point, I quit. What happened, though, was in losing myself, uh, and putting all of my efforts into being the best mother I could be, approaching motherhood as if I were approaching a trial. I read every book I could get my hands on, subscribed to every parenting magazine, and then they were kind of off on their own. And I was left with not really knowing what I wanted anymore. My husband and I had grown apart. Uh, he was fourth in line after the two children and the dog. I did not do what was required to nurture my relationship with him. And so after 25 years of being with this uh, man, who is a good man, I started drinking more and more and more to anesthetize myself from these feelings of a lack of self-worth. Who was I now without having to take care of my children in the way to which I had become accustomed. I had given up my legal career. Everything felt sort of empty. And so my drinking got way out of hand. And my then husband asked me to get help. I did go to rehab. I did go to AA. I still go to 12-step programs, which I view as a guide for living, a guide for being a good human. It's all about recognizing your part in anything that's going on in your life, making amends when amends are due, working on your character defects and paying it forward. And those are things that I will continue to do for the rest of my life. So at age 50, I felt rather, rather rudderless. I had never lived alone in my entire life. I had always had family members or friends as roommates and my husband asked for a divorce after my fifth rehab. I am a stubborn alcoholic and I don't begrudge him for that. He had to protect his heart. My children still have some resentment towards me. I can feel it, although they never say it. And I will live the rest of my life as a living amends to them for breaking up our family. However, at age 50, as a gift to myself, I decided to do 50 new things to explore how I wanted to live the next chapter of my life. And not all of these things are things I will repeat. <laughs> they, <laughs> I didn't even intend to write a book, but so many people asked me for this list because 50 is a common reckoning point for many of us in this society for reevaluating our lives. Typically at 50, we have more financial security. Our children are typically fairly on their way. Uh, we know a little bit more about who we are and what we want. And hopefully it's before the aches and pains of old age have set. It. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't get there before you can't, right? Yes, exactly. So let's move into that because I know I would love to hear more about your 50 things and, and even if they are ones you wouldn't repeat, I know they were all meaningful for you. And I believe that, you know, looking forward and making sure that we live our each chapter of our lives uh, in the most meaningful way, I know you and I are not alone in wanting to do that. So what are your top five of your 50? Well, the, the things that I did are grouped in various categories, like spiritual endeavors, social activities, physical challenges, thrill-seeking adventures, because we can, um, learning and teaching, and three other categories. 
each one, I, I didn't intend, as I said, to write the book and to categorize these various things I wanted to try, but the editors asked me to. And mm -hmm. it made sense for a book to have them in categories so that people could quickly go to whatever it was that interested them. So for instance, the first thing I did is not something I've anyone I've encountered is likely to do, <laughs> which is <laughs> I sold most of my belongings gave them away, donated them, put the, what I wanted to keep in storage, and then moved to the opposite side of the globe. I volunteered in the poorest region of Nepal, high in the Himalayas, eight hours hike from the closest road, wow. and helped at a school and to build a library there for the children who had never met a Westerner. It was extraordinary that this this village was so remote. They had no running water, no electricity. Yes, I did use an outhouse for two months. Don't wish to repeat that, but it was for me an exercise in cultivating gratitude because just by virtue in living in a developed nation, we know we will have access to clean water. We will eat today and we will have access to medical care even if we're homeless. And that is not the case in many developing nations, including Nepal. So I had found myself wallowing in pity about breaking up my very cushy life. My ex-husband uh, was a man of means. I never would have had to work again, but that wasn't what I really wanted in my heart. It felt inauthentic to me to not make the world a better place on more of a global level, just for me. Mm -hmm. or even to bloom fully where I was planted by, although I was doing volunteer work at the time, I wanted to, I wanted more. And it I needed to found it. Out and I found it, I found it, yes. So that is one thing, but there are also things like I never drive if I can walk. I walk everywhere I possibly can. And in so doing, I have discovered walking labyrinths in church gardens that I've passed hundreds of times in my car and in my haste to get to the next place. And walking labyrinths alone to just meditate, to be quiet, to actually listen rather than I'm a talker, as you might have guessed by now, I can talk to anyone. And I needed to listen more. I needed to listen to my inner voice. Also in Manhattan in particular, since each neighborhood of Manhattan is a microcosm of society and mm -hmm. there is a vast array of different neighborhoods in Manhattan. Yeah. And uh, I love walking in Manhattan because you can see in the course of a couple hours, so a huge swath of life and wherever your listeners are right now in Orange County, it's a beautiful, stunningly beautiful place. And yes. if people walked and appreciated what is right in front of them, it could have a magnificent effect on their well being. Absolutely. So that's, and Manhattan is not the only walking city, but it is a great one. I know when I now walk around Washington, D.C., I also make incredible discoveries. And like you said, I'm usually in a hurry to get from point A to point B, but taking that time and slowing down has been very, very meaningful in the last few years. Yes, absolutely. I have grown up in Washington, DC. I went away for school and for short periods of time, but Washington, DC has more than a hundred embassies and you can visit them. And that is actually being on foreign land when you are on an embassy property. And so I've taken advantage of that. I joined a women's group, the Women's Diplomatic Society, and we meet with ambassadors and their staff and learn about the countries. And that's, that's amazing. Within a half hour of my home. So I just encourage everyone to walk to the next town over or even the next neighborhood and the riches that you will be rewarded with are, are almost mind blowing. It's so simple that there's so much in front of us that we take for granted unless we open our eyes. Absolutely true. So give us another one of your 
of your 50 items, your 50 outings. Sure, sure. Your- well, <laughs> under social activities, there's a chapter called Dating for Dowagers. I had not been dating for 25 years. It was a little unsettling to throw my hat back into the ring. And so the, that chapter is a little bit tongue in cheek. It does talk about my adventures in online dating, which were not successful. But I did join a group called Professionals in the City that had events. So one of the events is speed dating. I feel that I can have a better read on another person if I'm if they're in front of me, if I can read their body language. And so speed dating was a more fruitful endeavor for me in terms of finding people that I would like to date. The one, one example of something I will never do again is I went to an open mic night in Washington, DC, and I belted out a song and I am not a good singer. I just wanted to know what it felt like to sing in front of an audience. I left to one polite applause, but I knew I was bad. The Most lesson- They were thanking you to get off the stage, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and the lesson in that episode was, I felt fear, but I did it anyway. And I now know that I can do scary things and it's not gonna kill me. It's gonna teach me something. And while it doesn't mean that I have to do the scary thing again, it bolstered my confidence, my pu- even my public speaking ability because I knew that I was really bad at that, but I didn't die, it was fine. You didn't die, and we're so <laughs> glad you didn't. Maria, where can people get the book? Where can they get more information on you? Give us some of your coordinates. Thank you. Well, the number one central place is marialeonardolson.com, and that has a link to my TEDx talk, to where to buy my book. I encourage people to go to independent bookstores. Many libraries have the book because it was given a good rating by Library Journal. It's available on Audible, although they didn't let me do the narration. And so I don't really care for the narration on that book. In any event, it's available on um, online. It's available as paperback or hard copy. I love doing book talks. I love connecting with other women in particular about their struggles. My social media is at 50, F-I-F-T-Y, at the number 50, 50 after 50. And we connect on online. And I love to talk to people To If there's anything that I have done that can help another person not start from scratch or not feel so alone, I will do everything in my power to help that person. You are not alone, people. I have gone through divorce, sobriety, um, sexual assault, empty nesting, uh, quite an array of experiences that I believe I can help you with. Experience is where we get our lessons. That is the best way to go. So thank you for sharing with anyone who is looking for any assistance. And we will post the the links for the, uh, the website and also where people can get the book. Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the light you put into the world, Lauren. Uh, Thank you. And we'll be right back.